Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Hello, friend, and welcome in. This is a bonus episode to tag along to the previous episode that I did on manifesting as a spiritual journey. I felt as if I needed to have a conversation about the elephant in the room, some things that are typically there, present in our lives, but few of the people that talk about law of attraction and manifesting really address. And as this has been coming through my head, uh, there is a possibility that as I discuss this, that I could swear. So I want to tell you up front that this may have some explicit language. In fact, it will. I'll just swear for the hell of it. But... uh, I want to, you know, if if you are easily offended or if you don't want to hear words like that, you can leave now. And I am going to mark this uh, in, I have to, for public purposes, mark the episode as explicit, although the podcast in general does not use profanity. I don't use profanity on a regular basis, although I have been known to swear like a sailor from time to time. Now, when I was younger... My dad always taught me that profanity is the feeble efforts of a frustrated mind to express itself forcibly. But I think there's still some room in our language, in communication, for a curse word or two to come through just for emphasis. So if you're still listening, you've been forewarned. You've had a time to leave. Now, this conversation, like I said, is an addendum, an add-on, a bonus to that episode that's manifesting is a spiritual adventure. And in that episode, I said that we are a spiritual being immersed in the human experience. And as such, this is the human adventure of the spirit. And when I say adventure, I did not say prayed. Some adventures have danger lurking. And... What most people don't tell you on the front end of this journey is that it can be fucking tough, hard. Some days are really dark. You'll have setbacks and disappointments. They talk about, you know, happily ever after in loving relationships. Yet sometimes they're devastating. Sometimes they're downright cruel. And because they don't tell us this on the front end, when it happens, it can be shocking. It can be, you know a kick in the teeth, and you're knocked down trying to catch your breath, and you're wondering, what in the hell happened? How did I deserve this? But that's the lie. It's not about deserving, because let me go back to that thinking. You know, we were told it was going to be wonderful. It's going, you know, our path of spirituality is going to be filled with light and rainbows and feeling good and high vibrations. But the truth is, this human adventure can be hard. It's not designed to be a smooth road. It is a broken road with potholes and detours and construction signs and backups, traffic backups. But then you're human. You know this. What you may not know is this is expected. You're supposed to have experiences like this. You're going to have trials and tribulations. They're going to come up. It's part of being human. And what is part of being human, of having the spiritual adventure, is rising above them. And when we encounter those trolls and critics, those people that talk down to us, talk bad about us, feed us with lies about who we are and who we aren't, they have the limited perspective, and they're dealing with their own trauma, their own hurt, and that's projected on us. And if we're young When we receive that information, sometimes we take it on like it's the truth, but it isn't. It isn't. It's a fucking lie. And the the people that have hurt us, either intentionally or unintentionally, they're operating out of their own feelings of inadequacy. Not because we're inadequate, not because there's something wrong with us. There's something wrong with them. But it's all too easy to take this, this feedback as meaning something about us. And this is the spiritual adventure, to rise above these circumstances, to face them, 
knowing that it's part of the journey in our our spiritual job, our spiritual purpose is to transform these low vibration experiences into wisdom. It is the meaning, the very meaning of alchemy, to turn lead into gold, to turn these, these heavy situations, these heavy vibrational moments into gold, light, divine light. When these hermetic societies talked about the power of alchemy, it was not literally turning lead into gold. It was symbolic language to talk about the, the transformation, transmutation of these lower vibrant experiences into something that serves us. And it's coming from the attitude that everything is working on our behalf, even the devastating moments. Now, you might be asking, what brought this conversation on? Well, part of it, it's been flowing through me, but I'll let you know that personally, we are urban farmers. Now, when I say we're urban farmers, for the most part, it's my wife, and I'm just the handyman that works on the farm. We've turned the backyard into food-producing real estate. We even have chickens, which are allowed, but we're in a fairly suburban area. Now, in our household, I am the early riser. I typically get up at 3.30, 4 o'clock, and I'm up when the sun comes up, just like the chickens. So I've been going out and feeding the chickens when they're up. Because if I don't, then they're making a ruckus, making a racket. Where's our food? Well, I got up the other day at 3.33 and actually took a picture on my phone. And it was about 15 minutes later, I was down in the kitchen preparing a cup of coffee. And I heard a ruckus outside in the, the coop. And I knew something was getting at the chickens because they were screaming. By the time I got out there, three of our four chickens were dead. And whatever was uh, attacking the chickens scuttled up over the fence as it heard me approach. I could hear it leaving, but I didn't see it. My guess is that it was a raccoon. The last chicken that it killed, that I, the one that I heard, was already dead, was just dying. And the, the last moments of life were leaving its body, was shaking on the ground. I looked over and the other two chickens had already been killed earlier, feasted on. It was it looked like a murder scene. And I have and I have to tell you that this scene was sad. It was hard to look at. I knew I had to go up and tell my wife because her chickens are her babies, and I have grown somewhat affectionate towards them myself. But what struck me and I realize there's worse worse things going on in the world, but what struck me it was just the sheer brutality of this event. It was almost as if they were killed for sport because only one was really eaten. I think it would have been more understandable if one had been taken and you saw feathers all over the place and they, they took it back and fed their young. But they didn't. They just kind of killed them at the scene and left them. Here it is, 4 a.m., just after 4 a.m., and all I can see is by the flashlight. So I start cleaning things up. I start picking up the bodies. And I have to admit, I had I had the thought that the last chicken was killed. It was still warm. It was that I should prepare it to eat it. But I don't think emotionally I could have done it. But my practical brain was there. But my mind responding as I've trained myself to do is when things happen like this, I ask, what's the lesson here? How does this serve me? What does this now make possible? Because I always believe there's a silver lining to it, and I have to admit, I'm still looking for it. But Ginger was the chicken that was left. She was still in the coop. She was huddled down. And I'm hard-pressed for anyone to tell me that animals do not feel things, that they do not have emotions, and they do not have conscious thought. For the next three days, in fact, she's still somewhat shocked and shaken, sad. You you can feel it. E empathetically, you can feel the sadness. And I have to admit, there's a part of me that really wants to do harm to that raccoon. But he was just operating from his instinct, from what raccoons do. It reminds me of a Zen story about the monk and the scorpion. And it goes like this. One day, a, a monk was walking along a stream. When he saw a scorpion 
struggling in the water. Knowing that scorpions cannot swim, he knelt down and scooped it up out of the water. But just before setting it down, the scorpion turned and stung his hand. The monk withdrew his hand in pain, and the scorpion fell back in the stream. When the monk realized this, he scooped his hands down again to save the scorpion. And just as before, the scorpion stung his hand, fell back in the stream. The scene repeated itself several times. A little boy who was playing near the stream asked the monk, Excuse me, why do you keep trying to save that scorpion? Don't you know it will just sting you every time you try to rescue it? The monk, picking up a leaf and rescuing the scorpion successfully this time, replied, Dear boy, just as it is a scorpion's nature to sting, and the water's nature to make things wet, so it is my nature, a monk's nature, to save. I think the lesson here is to be true to your nature, to allow others to be true to their nature, to respect that whatever they're going through is their journey, not yours. Don't take it personal. You know what? I just got it. Right when I was telling that story, I got it. I got what the lesson was in that experience. Now, back to the elephant in the room. The thing that no one really wants to talk about. You can be doing everything right, quote unquote. You can be doing all your steps correctly. You can be in a high vibe state, saying your affirmations, picturing things the way you want them, and shit can still hit the fan. And this is true. It's not your fault. Now, you are responsible for your response when it happens, but we are in a co creative environment here on planet Earth. We are interacting with other people. And sometimes, sometimes, things get worse before they get better. You see, sometimes, sometimes when you create a marvelous, wonderful intention that seems kind of beyond your current station or circumstances in life, it may invite a setback experience. Or, put another way, a shitty experience. This phenomenon in uh, social science terms is affectionately called the region beta paradox. Region beta paradox. And how it was originally set forth in this paper is if you consider a commuter who has the habit of walking to different destinations, typically destinations within a mile of her origin, and then cycling or driving to more distant destinations, since the bicycle is faster or the car is faster, theoretically, the commuter will reach some distant locations much quicker than near destinations because you've transcended the comfort zone, reversing the normal tendency to arrive later at more distant locations. Meaning that when the struggle was harder, the person took a different route, a different path to get to that further destination rather than walk. They came up with a different solution. Another way to look at this is when you boil frogs alive. And I don't know who in the fucking did this the first time, but it's downright cruel. So if you put a frog into a pot of boiling water, it will jump out right away. But if you put a frog in cool water and turn up the heat, it will swim around slowly acclimating to the increased temperature until it finally boils to death. But how does this apply to your life? How does it apply to anybody's life? And before I go right to the jugular, right to the point, I want to, I want to pose a question that was on my mind for many, many years. How could someone go from a successful job, a successful family life, home life, to being homeless? You know, something happens in their life, either a financial reversal or they lose their job and they start acquiescing to a new normal. And before they know it, the boat is gone. They come and take the boat and then the car, then the house. And then finally, they're on the street. Or maybe at that point, they rallied and said, I'm not going down anymore. This isn't going to happen. And then they pull themselves together. You see, during that decline, those small incremental moments were within their comfort zone. A, a bit uncomfortable, but 
not that uncomfortable. Just comfortable enough to where they could tolerate it. And so they began explaining the decline in their lifestyle, the decline in their living situation. And this just doesn't happen in the financial side of it. It happens in relationships. You know, one argument after another, one disappointment after another. You begin to tolerate a decline in the amount of love shared between two people. And as we observe it, as we look at it, the decline in our lifestyle, the decline in our love life, seems like it's explainable. It's understandable given the circumstances. And to really understand this, you need to understand the human nature, or the human being as an animal, we're animal and spirit. From our animal perspective, we are keenly adaptable. We are designed to acclimate to changing situations, changing environments, changing parameters in our reality. And so the region beta paradox basically says that if change happens too slowly, if decline happens too slowly and incrementally over time, that we tend to tolerate it and adapt to it. And that if it happened quickly, like suddenly, thing, you know, suddenly we lose our job, we lose our house, everything, like overnight, we'll do anything at that moment to get it back. We're more motivated to recapture what we expect to have. See, when it's a slow decline, we change our expectations to adapt to the outside circumstances. And this is, the, this is where the spiritual aspect comes in, where you turn lead, the alchemical process of turning lead into gold, is where you need to transmute, transcend the situation and create your vision. Well, this episode actually went a little long. And the good news is that I'm not swearing as much as I thought I might. But uh, I broke this up into two episodes. So this was part one. You can pick up with part two and the rest of the story in the next episode. So until next time, this is your friend and host, Daniel DeNovi, urging you to follow your bliss. Live your life from inner signals. Be inner directed as you engage in the epic adventure. (laughs) 